Well, hello there, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from wispolitics.com. And we're here today with a special program assessing the state federal infrastructure push. Um, and this is presented by Kapoor. I wanna thank Jeff Stone, former state legislator now with Kapoor for helping us put this together. Also wanna thank our sponsors, our other sponsors for this program, WTBA, the Wisconsin Transportation Builders Association and the Construction Business Group, Building Wisconsin together. So thank you sponsors. Um, just before we get started and uh, introduce our program, I uh, also wanna uh, uh, tell you about a program we have tomorrow at wisbusiness.com on uh, assessing the summer tourism uh, boom that uh, we and a lot of other states uh, may be experiencing. So we'll be discussing that tomorrow uh, at wisbusiness.com in the virtual program. You can find the details about that and other uh, of our uh, other events that we're doing in the uh, right-hand column at wispolitics.com. But today we're talking about infrastructure. Uh, this perhaps uh, you know is the greatest infrastructure push uh, maybe in a quarter century uh, that uh, is about to take place at the state and federal level. Uh, President Biden has introduced a bill uh, in Congress for 2.3 trillion investments in infrastructure. Um, so hundreds of millions, if, if that happens, hundreds of millions of that will come to Wisconsin. That's in addition to other federal uh, COVID relief funds that could be used for uh, some infrastructure, speaking broadly, and, and uh, you know the regular state budget proposals uh, from uh, Governor Evers uh, that are now before the state legislature. So we've got a lot to talk about today, and we're going to start off with U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin. Welcome, Senator Baldwin. It's a delight to join you. Thanks for having me. Yes, this the amount of money here is really um, uh, overwhelming. But I mean, it is it's such a. I think it's a, 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 a. Many people are seeing it as an opportunity that we haven't had in a while to fix a lot of things that need fixing. What's your view for, viewpoint on this? Well, I do think that we need a robust investment in our nation's infrastructure. You know, I think about what we traditionally think about as infrastructure, our roads and bridges, transportation infrastructure of all sorts. And the nation's civil engineers, structural engineers give us failing grades for uh, how we've maintained them. And I could say uh, from my own perspective as uh, a, a senator from Wisconsin, uh, seeing the increased frequency of extreme weather events and seeing entire roads and uh, bridges washed out, um, we have to build back stronger and more resiliently as we do this rebuilding. So I think of this investment as sort of above and beyond the type of annual or every five year authorization we do for surface transportation and water infrastructure and broadband investment. I see us taking care of many, many years of deferred maintenance and making sure that we are ready for the 21st century uh, economy uh, and, and making the same sort of investments that our near peer uh, economic competitors are making. Right, so, uh, you know, of course, uh, a president just doesn't propose a bill and it passes. And I'm wondering how optimistic you are that the core elements of the Biden program can get through the Senate. Yeah, so as, as you, I would start by noting that in many respects, the Biden jobs plan, uh, the infrastructure plan was uh, an outline uh, grounded by several really critical values, including uh, resiliency and putting people back to work uh, as we uh, rebuild our economy after the pandemic, et cetera. Um, but the, he is leaving to Congress the fleshing out of, of many of the details. And so many of the elements of this package are entirely bipartisan. And I think you've seen a commitment already to move forward in a bipartisan manner on those components that we can. By way of example, we passed in the Senate uh, a water infrastructure reauthorization uh, just a few weeks ago. 
And this week and next, we are debating on the floor a major investment in innovation, research, and development that's uh, being characterized, I think, as a competitive pa uh, package to make sure that our R&D investments and our investments in the manufacturing sector uh, around innovation um, will keep us uh, in the lead uh, in global competition, especially in critical areas like development of 5G platforms or quantum computing or making um, uh, car batteries for the uh, evolving uh, fleet of vehicles that we'll be producing. Um, we need to be part of the leading edge of that not lagging behind again near peers in uh in in the uh, 21st century economy right so um you know uh, vice president harris made a visit to uh milwaukee recently and you were part of that and uh you talked about the r d effort here you know a lot of these things are happening in wisconsin and so uh, a lot of uh that kind of uh, money would boost wisconsin industry efforts manufacturing and research and development at uh, at the uh, state schools right absolutely i mean i see so much potential for wisconsin's you know take a take a look at the fact that we are still one of the leading manufacturing states in the country uh, by uh, measure of the percent of our economy uh, uh, percent of our workers engaged in manufacturing activities and we want to keep that lead and we also you know want to expand it where we can and I think as we move forward. Um, so much of this critical infrastructure and critical products um, needs to be reshored in the US and frankly if it's in Wisconsin all the better. Uh, so that said, uh, you know when when Vice President Harris came to Wisconsin to talk about these opportunities it was very exciting because it was not only about this research enterprise uh, that we have to uh, revive in the US, um, but also about how we can reshore some of our supply chains, especially when it has to do with uh, critical products that um, we depend upon for our health, for our safety, et cetera. And so partnering between private manufacturing and uh, government at all levels will also be key. I, I think I, I forgot the punchline earlier when you were talking about how much of this can be done on a bipartisan basis. Um, by mentioning the bill that's before the Senate right now, I will tell you that this, um, this need to invest in our competitiveness um, is something that does enjoy strong bipartisan support. Uh, it came out of the Commerce Committee last week, uh, 20, I think it was 22 to four. So uh, good, good support. And I do expect as we work through amendments that we'll see that piece of the infrastructure plan uh, pass uh, uh, promptly. So uh, what is the what is that bill that you're talking about? Is that's not one of your bills uh, that you've introduced with uh, uh, the by with the Rubio and others? Or is that something else? Um, it's something else. So I'm talking about uh, what is known as the Endless Frontiers Act. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. and that's uh, before the Senate this week, and it will be also next week as we work through it. Um, but again, uh, it, it is a bold investment uh, that relates very much to uh, our infrastructure and our competitiveness uh, globally. Uh, these it, the failure to make these once in a generation investments will be to our uh, economic detriment uh, in in the long term. Right now, I want to get to a couple of bills that you introduced. One with yes. Mike Braun, a, a yes. Republican from Indiana, and the other from Marco Rubio, a Republican from Florida. And both of these have to do with uh, taking care of uh, um, infrastructure and extreme weather events. Can you tell us a little bit about these two bills? Yeah, and they also focus on make it in America, buy America. Um, so right now uh, we are still, uh, as we as we launch an effort to uh, uh, build back, build back better. Um, we have a lot of buy America policies in our infrastructure uh, statutes, but there are lots of gaping holes. There are lots of waivers given, and I think we need to really examine that uh, in the infrastructure area before we spend uh, tax dollars and 
uh, you know, we don't want to be surprised to find those going overseas supporting uh, companies and workers that uh, are not uh, US based or uh, paying US taxes. Uh, so that's what I've worked on with Senator Braun, uh, Republican of Indiana, uh, one of the other lead manufacturing states like Wisconsin. And then um, with Senator Rubio, we're really working at updating our, um, our building standards. So again, if we're going to make this once in a generation investment in um, our nation's infrastructure, we need to be building with an eye to the future. We need to be building with an eye towards uh, the best uh, data we can get on what uh, sort of extreme weather uh, we'll see, how frequently, and making sure that we're not year after year uh, rebuilding uh, uh, damaged infrastructure because we didn't make it more resilient in the rebuilding process. It's sort of uh, penny wise, pound foolish. And I think all of your uh, officials on the next panel have experienced uh, uh, these severe weather events and uh, know that we need to be forward looking uh, when we rebuild. Okay, just to close out here, Senator, uh, it, it, you mentioned bipartisan, you have talked about bipartisan bills, but there does seem to be a big gap between the 2.3 trillion and what uh, your Republican colleagues um, who have 50 votes, uh, you know, want to want to do, and I think they're about to, reports say they're about to up that to 800 million, which isn't 2.3 trillion. So I guess how important is this bringing in uh, you know Republican votes to make sure that it is a true bipartisan package that it isn't uh, that you don't have to do the reconciliation uh, route that uh, you did previously. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that um, we will end up uh, avoiding uh, reconciliation for some aspects of this, um, this bold vision that was presented by uh, President Biden. But as I've indicated, there are many opportunities and areas of agreement where we are moving forward on a bipartisan basis, and that's exciting. You know, if I were to tell you about what I view as the biggest sticking points, um, and it, one is just the definition of uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, there's been any number of uh, Republican critics who have said uh, very little of the Biden plan is about uh, traditional infrastructure as we think of it. Um, and I think that, you know, if our economy is to grow and if we are to uh, remain uh, the leading economy in this world on breakthrough uh, technologies and, um, you know, things that um, uh, are coming very quickly at us, that um, we do need to make uh, this definition of infrastructure quite expansive and, um, and we need to make these investments. So broadband, for example, uh, is in my mind, critical for our uh, continuing competitiveness. And the goal of the Biden plan is to have 100% access to broadband throughout this nation um, over the eight year time horizon of this bill. Um, that is something that I think has bipartisan support. Um, but uh, that said, uh, I think there's been the unwillingness to come to grips with how we pay for it, that we have to pay for this. This is not something that's gonna go into uh, you know, long-term deficit or debt. And um, I propose, or I support uh, Joe Biden's uh, pay for proposal that goes along with the American Jobs Act. But as he has said, if anyone has a reasonable alternative, bring it to him, uh, bring it to all of us and, and we'll debate that. But we can't, um, we can't keep deferring the maintenance on, uh, on our infrastructure uh, decade after decade after decade uh, anymore. Right, and that's one of the sticking points too is the pay for, right? You know, uh, uh, Biden and, and Democrats wanna raise the corporate uh, income tax and uh, Republicans uh, generally do not. There's also been no talk of a gas tax increase because of uh, Biden's pledge to not, uh, you know, have user fees that would affect uh, lower income individuals. So, 
Right. I mean, and, are, and are you optimistic ask, about, uh, you know, getting through that pay for without having user fees? Um, yes. Uh, so, so one thing, you know, yes, indeed, uh, Joe Biden has proposed raising taxes on large corporations that don't currently pay their fair share. Uh, and these are the uh, industries that are going to benefit most mightily from these investments uh, to get their products to market, to get their inputs, et cetera. Uh, the other thing I want to say about that is, believe it or not, this is a pretty popular pay for. Uh, I think everyone saw in 2017 the corporate rate go down uh, actually uh, uh, more than uh, the big corporations had even asked for it to go down. This would restore it uh, not to what it was uh, prior to 2017, but less than, uh, than it was and still provide the revenue needed uh, to make these, you know, again, once in a generation investments to get back up to par or build back better, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senator. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And I uh, hope you can uh, keep us informed about uh, the progress of this uh, down the road. So thanks a lot. Thank so you. Take care. So we're gonna bring in our panel now, uh, the, uh, the people who would uh, implement the money if it uh, indeed comes from the feds and, and uh, people who are, uh, uh, the people who are really watching uh, this very closely and how it would affect uh, their constituents and uh, the people in Wisconsin. So I want to introduce our panel uh, and we have uh, Wisconsin DOT Secretary Craig Thompson, Waukesha County Executive Paul Farrell, Nina Mayor, Dean Cofford, a former member of the state legislature and the Joint Finance Committee, and Milwaukee Mayor Tom Baer. Welcome, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Well, let me just start with you, uh, uh, Mayor Barrett. Um, you know, you're a supporter of, of, of Biden, obviously. What is the right amount from the federal government? Uh, you know, is, is, uh, is Biden asking for too much, uh, you know, in terms of is his definition of uh, what constitutes infrastructure too broad? No, I don't think it's too broad at all. And I think the real issue, as the senator pointed out, is, okay, how do we pay for this thing? Um, because literally for decades, everyone says they're in favor of more infrastructure, um, but the proof is in the pudding in terms of, are you gonna pay for it or not? And, and I do think that the mechanism that he has created to pay for it is fair. Now, the challenge, of course, is it would require Republicans who voted for these major corporate tax cuts in 2017 to reverse themselves. I don't see that happening. I just, I just don't see that happening. Even though, as the Senator correctly pointed out, the rate would be lower than it was prior to 2017. Um, so I think, as again, as the Senator said, I think that there are certainly areas where there's agreement. Um, I'm not optimistic that you're gonna have bipartisan agreement on how to pay for it. And, and I wish I could be more optimistic, um, but you pointed out correctly, Jeff, the gap. It's, it's $800 million coming from, uh, from Senator, the senators on the Republican side versus the $2.3 trillion on the Democratic side. So uh, I, I do think that they're headed in the right direction. And actually, I'm happy they're talking to each other. I think that that's important. All right, well, let's go to uh, Paul Farrow, the Waukesha County Executive. Paul, uh, what do you think in terms of, uh, of you know, the definition of, of what is infrastructure and, you know, would you like to see all that money or would you like a more narrowly defined uh, bill? Well, Jeff, thanks for having us and thanks for the, the opportunity. Um, you know, I find it kind of surprising as we're talking about it, we, we've gone away from the word words tax increase to pay for. Uh, when you look at roughly $2.3 trillion that we're talking about, uh, yeah, the challenge that I have, in, is, as Dean knows, when we work through the legislative process at the state, we look at things kind of individually, area by area. When you have an omnibus bill like this that's talking about $2.3 trillion, just about everybody that you look at says, okay, roughly 24% or about $550 billion is what is described as infrastructure. Our roads, our bridges, waterways, um, areas like that that we should focus on, broadband and things. I would rather have Congress looking at that and say, this is the area that we want to consider. Um, you know, when I look at things sitting at, the, at this seat, 
you've got to look at the big picture. And the mayor knows we've got so many different things that impact our budget, you know, from workforce to police force to infrastructure. We've got to take that whole picture into mind. I'm looking at $1.9 trillion that we just got from the rescue plan, 2.3 potentially for this transportation, another 1.8 for a jobs or America's family plan that the president's introducing, $6 trillion. There's no way that taxing is going to make all that back up. And so I would rather see it pared back down to exactly what we're trying to figure out and what we're trying to accomplish. So there may be too much money coming your way. Is that the you're not gonna complaining about that, are you? You know what? You should never complain that there's not or there's too much money coming one way, but as we all know, when the federal government sends us money, there are so many strings attached, you're not sure how you can use it or can you use it the way that's best for the people in Waukesha County. Okay, well, let's go to Nina Mayor Dean Cofford. Uh, Mr. Mayor, oh, you know, how do you uh, accept, uh, you know, this notion of, you know, what could be coming your way in terms of infrastructure money? Is this a, uh, is this a godsend or do you, are you worried about the, uh, the tax implications? Both. Uh, there's no question that the need to reinvest in infrastructure is real because I'm here to tell you from a local community standpoint, uh, we're falling behind and our roads are crumbling, our bridges need attention. Um, we the potholes get bigger each and every year. People notice that the roads are, you know, we spend here in a community of 26,000 people, we spend about uh, $6 million a year on roads and, and, and redoing roads and re re reconstruction and resurfacing. And it's not enough. Each and every year we're falling behind. So while I welcome the cash, um, it, it's, it's going to be, you know, I do worry about our future. You know, you look at our grandchildren and, and you, you, our kids and that, and are they going to pay the pill, bill later? Are they going to be stuck with uh, this huge debt? Um, you know, debt service from at a local level is, uh, is, is a, you know, concern for Paul Farrow and Tom Barrett. We all worry about our, our level of debt, but uh, you know, the strings that are attached to the money, um, I, I like that on one hand, but on the other hand, I, I do want flexibility. I want flexibility to utilize where, where we deem it's best spent and where we can leverage the most dollars from a regional aspect and you know maybe partner with our neighbors. So we have to have some flexibility to spend these dollars in a prudent, fiscally responsible way. Okay, let's go to Wisconsin DOT Secretary Craig Thompson. Craig, thanks for being here. I'm just wondering from, you know, if this actually happened, what would it mean for, you know, state roads and local roads? If this, if, and, and other infrastructure, what would it mean to Wisconsin if this federal bill went through? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. So, you know, to build upon what, what all, all three of the previous speakers said, if you look at what was similar in the United States and, and here in Wisconsin, we had literally decades of, of deferment um, as far as paying for uh, investing in our, in our roads and bridges and transportation infrastructure, uh, which, is, which is what uh, Governor Evers, one of the three points that he ran on. And last budget at the state level here is the first time we raised new ongoing revenue for transportation in a generation. Uh, it was about $465 million uh, in that budget, and, and we've dedicated every penny of that towards fixing either state highways or giving giving money to locals to help them with the backlog of what they had. But with all of that being said, uh, we think with that kind of investment, we may have finally stopped the decline uh, in conditions, uh, but we have a long way to go. And what, what Mayor Coffert was just talking about, what, what Mayor Barrett and what County Executive Farrow was talking about, if we look in Wisconsin, we've got about 115,000 miles of road, but 90% of that is at the local level. Um, and we're never, you know, when we say how much do we need, we're never going to get every, every mile of that up to good condition. That's not plausible. That's not practical. Uh, but, but we're a long way away yet. And to stop the decline is one thing. To improve those conditions that our agriculture is depending on, that our manufacturers are depending on, uh, that all these industries are depending on, we still have a long way to go. So um, a, a proposal uh, with this kind of money uh, would be an absolute shot in the arm. Uh, to be able to uh, allow uh, leaders, uh, mayors, and county executives to, to put more money into getting at that backlog, as well as us at the state level, uh, to try to take care of uh, our major needs with our bridges and roads. But 
uh, that would be it would be a major shot in the arm. But then, as Senator Baldwin had talked about, uh, there was reauthorization, which is more the traditional six year uh, package that Congress passes for for transportation. And that's one that I think we have to look to on the back of this, too, about how do we do it in an ongoing basis uh, beyond what's in this what's in this one time package. Yeah, same with you, uh, uh, Secretary Thompson. Okay, so there's also Governor Evers' proposal before the state legislature right now. And I think this is the debate, or this is the message the uh, majority of Republicans are sending. Well, how does how would this all this federal money mesh with the proposals in the governor's budget? You know, do they supersede them? Do they um, are they on top of them? You know, how do you mesh? Uh, you know, if this if this happens, how does it? How do you mesh this infrastructure money with the money in the state budget? Very easily, uh, and, and to answer that, it's on top of. Uh, as I talked about, uh, the amount of need that's there is not going to be filled even with every penny of this passed at the federal level, but it would be a tremendous help. So what we've proposed in this budget is another $75 million program uh, to go to the locals on a grant basis, our multimodal local supplement program to try to uh, have, have locals in each area decide where, where their needs are greatest and have that money go to them. We also proposed uh, increasing general transportation aids again. Those were really the two areas uh, that, that, and then we, we did do a, a cost to continue increase for our state highway rehabilitation program. Those were really for our, our road infrastructure, the three areas that we proposed increases in uh, for this budget. Again, really trying to focus on where the greatest need is. Uh, but if this, if this additional money would come in, it would just allow us to plow through more of the backlog at the state and local level. Right. So, okay. So now let's go to the local uh, elected officials. And let me ask you, if you didn't have strings attached or, you know, not, notwithstanding where the money would come from, you know, what would be your wish for how you would use that money first? How would you, you know, let's go to Mayor Baird. What would you, well, if you got a bunch of money from the feds on infrastructure, what would you want to use it for first? Well, there's, there's a couple of places where we would jump all over it. Um, one is not sexy at all, but incredibly important. And that is something like street streetlights. Uh, we've got an aging infrastructure for streetlights in this city. Um, and it's, it's a public safety concern. And so we would like to have a state of the art um, system for, for street lighting. So, so that's an easy one. And, and that's actually a place where we're looking to use some of the dollars from the, the money we're gonna receive already. And, and I've actually been surprised because as I've talked to Alderman and others, I thought, well, this isn't gonna be sexy enough, um, but there is a, a strong desire to, to deal with that portion of the infrastructure. Um, one that it is very, very important to us is also the whole aging infrastructure for things like lead pipes. Um, and this is something in, in the city of Milwaukee, we don't have lead in our water but we do have lead in our lead laterals. And if they're disrupted, that's where you have problems. So in my mind, it's, it's an aging infrastructure issue. Um, and that's one that we wanna deal with. Um, the broadband is, is an issue, not just in rural areas, it's an issue in the city. Um, and then the secretary can tell you about the condition of the roads, both the, the, the state roads that go through the city of Milwaukee, the interstate system, um, there is a need for repair there as well. Um, so we certainly are gonna be able to use that money. Um, there are problems with the port with, we had tremendous storms that had an impact on our lakefront. Um, so there, unfortunately, um, there is no shortage here. And I think this gets to the point though that the Senator was making that this really is a generational opportunity here. And, and I think one of the reasons it is so popular among the public is that they drive over these potholes. They, they, they know that there are problems. So, so this isn't something that's made up they know that we have aging infrastructure in this nation. And so when President Biden talks about how we're falling behind other countries in, in the condition of our infrastructure, as Americans, we're just not used to that. We, we don't wanna be 12th or 13th or, or whatever it is. We wanna lead the world. We don't wanna be number 12 or number 13. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, County Executive Farrell, if, you know, without the strings attached or whatever, what would be your, what would you use this money for? A Christmas wish list, huh? <laughs> so I guess the way I look at it, and, and a couple of years ago, we started doing this as we were looking at road projects. Not only do we look at the safety as a major issue when we're trying to either fix roads or expand the road systems that we have, but also economic development. So from a county perspective, I think the funds would be looked at how can we provide those better avenues for our businesses as they're growing 
so that trucks, transportation, employees, personnel can move freely. Uh, I think that's a major area that we continue to look at, uh, as well as the broadband. When you look at the kind of the new infrastructure, broadband would be important. But then if I put a second hat on as co-chair of the M7, I think regionally, we've got to look at the East-West Corridor in 94 and look at the expansion. You know, as the mayor and I both know, we have people in both Milwaukee County and Waukesha County that travel that daily. It's almost even now people working in Milwaukee or living in Milwaukee that come out to Waukesha and live in Waukesha that go into Milwaukee. So increasing that corridor, knowing the volume that we see go through there for consumer goods, not only personnel, uh, those would be the factors that I'd be looking at as we're placing priorities on our different projects. Okay, uh, Nina Mayor, Dean Coffer, what, what would you use, what, what's, what's your wish list? Well, thanks uh, for the question and, and it's similar and I will tell you this, uh, you know, we're going to, the state has done a fairly good job here in the Fox Valley, a real good job with the recent interchange uh, upgrades and that. But as Paul mentioned, it's all about economic development. It's all about goods, the businesses being able to get their goods and services to, to market, how quickly they can do that, how successfully, how, how, how the, the, the transportation system, they make decisions on where they're going to locate you know, based upon that. And we're competing with the other communities in the Fox Valley. We want them, of course, to look at Tanina. We want them to build in our business park, our industrial park in the areas, but we have to make sure and ensure that they have a good pipeline to get to the transportation system. So I would utilize it to try and leverage those dollars for future economic development. And we're gonna do the broadband, we're gonna do the lead pipes, we're gonna do the, the upgrades and, that are necessary. But the real need right now is, you know, the, the collector streets, the arterial streets, the, the streets that, you know, because of the, the way that things are right now with levy limits and everything else, we make our decisions based on priorities and some of those things are being left on the table and we're just never getting to them. In my seven years as mayor, I've pushed things off, pushed things off, pushed things off as long as we can. And it's got to the point where uh, the infrastructure is crumbling. So we're gonna have to make those investments. So that's why these dollars I think would be uh, welcomed uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, the, uh, Mayor Barrett said this stuff doesn't seem real sexy, except your list of deferred projects is long. And so it's sort of like this is an opportunity to clean, clean that up, I take it. Is that how you're kind of viewing it? I'll just say this, you know, I, if I learn one thing in Madison, it's you can only spend one time money one time. <laughs> and uh, as an old Mike Ellis and Bob Lang uh, cliche, but I will tell you that it, it's true. So you have to make sure you spend it because it's only one time, this ain't gonna happen for a long time. Uh, you gotta leverage it and get the most bang for the buck out of those dollars that you can. Okay, so I wanna to go to, uh, there's some audience questions here and uh, you know, Secretary Thompson, I think that uh, this is probably in, in your bailiwick and then we can go around to the, uh, the local elected officials here. There, there are several questions about rail. What could we do, you know, I mean, there was sort of a, a, a you know, remember high speed rail, the proposal that didn't really uh, take off, right? So is this another opportunity to, uh, you know, revive, uh, you know, a big, you know, expansion of rail, passenger rail? Well, you know, what I would tell you, Jeff, is, is what we've seen over the last couple of years, well, heading into the pandemic, which of course changed everything in terms of ridership and all that. But um, the Hiawatha line in the, in the uh, down near uh, the Mayor Barrett and County Executive Farrell, uh, it's been one of the most successful uh, Amtrak routes in the country um, between Milwaukee and Chicago there. And so uh, we've been working and we've got some federal grants to increase uh, the, the daily routes there. And we're looking to do that, increase that service. And then we've, we've worked with, um, with, there's another Amtrak route that goes from uh, the Twin Cities uh, down to Chicago. And right now it's called the Empire Builder and it goes on all the way out to the West Coast. And so when you have a route that goes that long, you know, to have your on times in the, in the stops in Wisconsin gets to be a little dicey, you know, how close they're gonna be to that. And so we were able to get a significant federal grant uh, for what's known as a TCMC, Twin Cities, Madison, Chicago, um, to, to run another line, but it only goes from, from the Twin Cities to Chicago. So we've seen some significant increases in what I think we can do with Amtrak 
uh, service right now. They've been wildly supported in those areas. Um, what's in the president's uh, proposal is another, um, I believe, $80 billion for Amtrak improvements. Um, and so, you know, if, if some or all of that goes through, I think there's additional things that we could do uh, in the state beyond that uh, to, to add to that rail service in Wisconsin. Okay, well, let's go to uh, Con Executive Farrow and Mayor Barrett on this one. There's a question here about commuter rail. Um, you know, that's, that can sometimes uh, be a, uh, a flashpoint uh, in uh, political discussions, but is this, is this discussion about a once in a generation funding uh, uh, levels, does that, does that inspire anybody to tackle things like commuter rail? Let's go with you first, uh, County Executive Farrow. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You know, I guess the challenge comes in, it's what I've been dealing with since I came into office in 2015. The commuter rail is a good conversation when you have population density. The challenge that we have is the last mile. And so we can talk about, as the secretary said, the Hiawatha is great because everybody goes to two locations here in Wisconsin, typically, or in this area, I should say. They go to either downtown Milwaukee or they go to the airport and then go down through Kenosha we got to get everybody down there first before they get on it and use it. And so you look at things, uh, as the mayor knows, they're working on bus rapid transit that would be going out to the medical complex, but it doesn't come any further. The challenge that we have is we have great jobs. We have well-paying jobs in Waukesha County, but getting people out here using the flexible systems, which are the roadways, are going to be the key. And I think that's where I go back to that 94 East West. I would rather see us solve these problems before we try to overlay a new parameter like commuter rails into the system. So I'll, on the Hiawatha, that is a total no brainer. Um, as the secretary mentioned, this is a wildly popular route between Chicago and Milwaukee and we should be investing it. And, and I think the fact that Senator, I mean, that President um, Biden rode that train back and forth between Delaware and Washington all those years. He, he understands that. So to me, that is the easiest of, of all of them. KRM, I think it's, it's time to revisit that. And you have challenges with Racine in particular, if you look at Racine and where it's located in proximity or not in proximity of I-94, it is, it is so far away from the interstate that is hampering Racine. But Kenosha, Milwaukee and Racine that, that's a natural. It's a natural to tie them together. And, and I think that, that that certainly is in play now as a result of the, these conversations. And I think it's good that it's in play. Um, all, of, all of the leadership in these communities understand the importance of that route as well. Right, Mr. Mayor. But I mean, um, I think if, if you were to do a poll of people who commute, uh, they're probably going to be asking for um, a, a faster commute in the highway, not not a, uh, I mean, how do you overcome that? Because there is money in here for, well, there would be a lot of money in here for public transit, but you still have to get people out of their cars. Well, yeah, and then I think you can do A and B. Um, I think you can and you should rebuild the, the, the interstate. I think you can and should rebuild the state highways and local streets, um, but we are talking about a significant amount of money. And so your question was, is, is this the time to have that conversation? And I think the answer is yes, it is the time to have that conversation. I guess the okay. challenge I would have, Jeff, though, is when we're having this conversation, we're talking about creating a new modal of transportation with high-speed transit outside of the Hiawatha line. One, as kind of Mayor Coffer put it, this is one-time money. How do we continue to pay for that operation and going on when we have seen typically it needs to be subsidized in order to do that. I would rather be looking at the flexibility system, especially when I look at the seven counties that make up the M7 down here, the, the majority of us have very low population density. And so we're trying to find ways that we create that last mile concept. A bus rapid transit can get us to point A, but it's that last mile and a half to get to the destinations where we're trying desperately to find a new vehicle to get there. And I think that's the concern I have. If we start putting ourselves locked into a, a rail line that goes from point A to point B and a couple of stops along the way, 
it doesn't spoke out to all the areas that our businesses need when it comes to workforce. Okay, let's have it. Let me ask uh, Mayor Crawford here. There is a question here on, uh, you know, could this help rail transportation to the Fox Valley? You know, um, you know, a lot of the talk has been, you know, um, you know, Minneapolis to Chicago, and that involves Southeast Wisconsin. What about, you know, a Green Bay to um, uh, Milwaukee line? When I was in the legislature, uh, we, we had talked about that. They had, you know, projected a potential route. Um, once again, getting people out of their cars is going to be very, very difficult. I just signed a letter this morning, uh, at least to, to have the conversation, to look at that. Some of the local mayors have, have talked about it. And, you know, this might be a good time to have that conversation. I just think that uh, Mayor Fair is probably right, is that we don't have the density. We don't have the, you know, getting people off that uh, uh that line and getting them to that last mile. I think he brings up a good point for those of us in the Fox Valley. Okay, so what I heard is uh, Mayor Barrett says, uh, it's good to examine uh, uh, the commuter rail KRM again. County Executive Farrow says roads first. And uh, Mayor Crawford says probably roads first. Secretary Thompson, do you have a view on the KRM? Well, you know, uh, as Mayor Barrett had talked about and being a native of Racine, um, I know for some of the major employers there like SC Johnson and others, um, you know, get, getting talent to and from there um, is important and they are located very far from, uh, from the interstate. So when, when you look at mega regions, um, you know, Chicago mega region goes all the way up to really up to Waukesha, I'd say. And so I think um, as popular as Hiawatha has been, um, you know, and we look at with the L coming right up uh, to Kenosha in that area. I think when we look at workforce retention and attraction, I think it's something that we really, really have to look at. Okay, let's let's talk about the. Does somebody want to chime in there? Or, no. Okay, let's talk about the you know waterworks. Okay, you know, and, and Mayor Barrett mentioned about lead uh, lead laterals, and uh, or lead tainted laterals, I guess I would say. But it, you know, it, there's many more. <laughs> Uh, things involved in the infrastructure of the waterworks and, you know, um, providing clean, uh, drinkable water. And then there's the, uh, the longstanding uh, um, dispute about, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, Lake Michigan water into Waukesha County. Uh, how can any of this uh, bill help with those uh, waterworks issues? I can say the, the water issue between Waukesha and Milwaukee, there's peace in the valley. Um, and it really was a pretty historic agreement that we reached um, to provide that. And I think that does demonstrate that these issues are not always partisan. Um, that if you have leadership that is willing to sit down and listen to each other and, and care for your own community, but at the same time be be cognizant of the needs of the other community, you can work things out. So, so I, I, think, I think we've come an incredibly long way um, between the sewer wars in the 1980s and 1990s to where we are today. Um, and are, are there gonna be flashpoints? Yes, they're flashpoints. Um, um, and I think that that's unfortunate when I deal with the, the city of Milwaukee Waterworks and we, we sell water to a lot of communities um, and, and we wanna continue to do that. We will continue to do that but we want to make sure that we're attending to all of our needs at the same time. Uh, uh, no, Executive I, Farrell, I, peace, peace in the Valley. Yeah, I would, I would echo uh, the mayor's correct. There is peace in the Valley. Now, keep in mind that the city of Waukesha and the city of Milwaukee are the partners. Waukesha County doesn't have a, a pipe in this one. We don't deal with the water on that, but I agree that when you look at the lead laterals, especially Milwaukee and what the mayor's got to deal with, those are things that we have to work on and we have to fix. Uh, that's why I think when, again, as I look at the big pot of money in the rescue plan, there is monies available for that. That was one of the areas, waters, broadband are in, are in there. So that is something that they can work on already. That's where my concern is, again, is we're looking at one pot over here and suddenly coming up with another pot to look at how much money we can throw in. Um, I know the mayor's got a lot of lead laterals, but at some point, as Dean said, we are gonna get done replacing them, then what? And so I think that the good news is when you look at water, 
The Great Lakes Compact did exactly what it was supposed to do. It was thoughtful and thorough when it considered of municipalities outside of the basin if they needed water and worked the way it was. That is a great way to show how government working together, like the mayor says, when you've got all of those organizations working together can do the right thing if they get the right information and see what's happening. Okay, uh, Mayor Cofford, uh, uh, in terms of uh, waterworks and uh, you know taking care of water systems, uh, what sort of need have you heard of in, uh, in your community? Yeah, well, Nina, Nina's at peace with Milwaukee and Waukesha. On this one, so don't worry about that. God bless you. Uh, but uh, I, I will say this. I mean, we face similar challenges with regard to lead uh, in our system. We just changed our ordinance to say that, you know, when your street's done, you mu now mu you must replace your, your uh, from the road to the house. Uh, and we need to, you know, find ways to financially incentivize or, or help these folks that uh, maybe have uh, uh, marginal incomes in that. But, uh, you know, water is the most important thing here. We're looking at selling water for the first time ever. Uh, Nina has historically uh, said that we weren't going to sell outside our boundaries. And we're now going to look at that for neighboring communities because of incorporation things that are going on with incorporations and annexations, but we want to be good neighbors. Um, uh, but we also want to make sure that we're not tying our hands for the future. Uh, and so, yeah, these dollars would help clearly would help in the, uh, in the water area, waterworks area. Okay. Let me go to secretary Thompson. Now, you know, in this proposal from Biden uh, is 174 billion to quote, win the, electric vehicle market, spurring domestic supply chains, giving consumers rebates to buy electric vehicles. So one of the questions from the audience is, how should we prepare Wisconsin's infrastructure for the coming electrification of transportation? And I guess that would include, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, how we fund things and whether registration fees, et cetera. Well, uh, what about that, Secretary Thompson? How do we win well, that? It, it, it's a great question, Jeff. And I would tell you, to me, this is going to be one of the, there, there's a lot of transformational things that are going to be occurring as it pertains to our transportation network across the country. Uh, connected and autonomous vehicles is going to be one uh, that, that we're going to, is, is going to transform a lot of things, but more immediately is going to be the electrification. And if you look at what's going on in the private sector right now, uh, the, the big automobile makers have made their choice. This isn't something that that you, know, you make a choice and then you change your mind again in two years and that they seem to have put their chips in. And GM has said by 2025, uh, their fleet that they're producing is gonna be all electric. Um, Ford just came out with the electric uh, F-150. So if we're moving as rapidly as it looks like uh, from our automakers, uh, on the public side, we've gotta be ready for that. And I think there's gonna be room for uh, private sector part with charging stations and all of that to, to be part of that. But from the public sector, we've gotta ensure that we're ready for that as well. So Governor Evers put in uh, some money on our end uh, to look at doing that and why I think President Biden uh, has put in such an aggressive amount because um, you know it's one thing to have the vehicles that are electric, but you gotta have, you gotta have places that can charge them. Uh, if we're going to really go through this kind of a major transformation in, the, in what's appearing to be a pretty compressed time period. Okay, well, would this affect the way roads are funded in Wisconsin? I mean, if, if, if we're not paying the gas tax, right? Well, that, that is, that's the next question then, right? And I talked about there's this, uh, the president's proposal, which he does offer a way to pay for it uh, through that corporate income tax. It's different, different than um, you know, our ongoing, usually when we've talked about user fees, as you talked about in the beginning. Now, I will say this, we've got a system right now that, that at the federal level, we say is paid for with user fees, and, and it, that's somewhat true. Um, we have not changed the federal gas tax since 1992. Um, and so it was really in George W. Bush's term. Uh, we had a balance in the highway trust fund for a while, but then those, those lines crossed and uh, we now pay for our, our federal through some of that federal gas tax, uh, but then the rest has just been basically deficit spending uh, because we haven't wanted to talk about adjusting that user fee. As we move forward and we have uh, electric vehicles on the road, which is going to be much better for the climate and we have autonomous and connected vehicles and all that. If, if A, we're going to have to decide, do we still want a user fee system? Is that, is that the idea that we want that has been somewhat broken for a while now? But if we do, 
it's going to have to be different than the gas tax uh, moving forward because you can't have all electric vehicles and raise your money from a gas tax. That's a fairly obvious statement. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of states around the country and regions that have been piloting what's known as mileage based user fees. Um, that is agnostic on what you're using to power your vehicle. It'd be on the amount of miles you travel. We could go to a national system uh, like that is for a user fee system or we get or we break, you, you know, um, break from or tolling or you break from the user fee concept and you just you just say that that's we're not doing that anymore and and you fund it you know from the general fund as a, as a general good i think those are you know broadly some of the options that are going to be out there and i think this is quickly becoming an equity issue as well it was just two weeks ago for the first time in my life i rode in a tesla and my reaction was wow this is like riding in a spaceship um and not surprisingly it was owned by a very wealthy person and so if, if you're seeing, and this is inevitable, the first wave of electric cars are going to be purchased by people who are wealthier, um, just because they're going to be more expensive at that time. And lower income people are going to continue to drive older vehicles that use gasoline. And so we, we cannot create a system where the wealthiest people don't pay anything towards the roads or very little towards the roads. And the people who are driving the beaters and the jalopies are paying, are paying for it. So I think that this is gonna to come to a head much, much quicker, particularly when you talk about the moves that these major auto manufacturers are making in the, in the next few years. Well, right, because it's not gonna be like, uh, everybody's not gonna, uh, the supplies are gonna be there. You're not, gonna, not everybody's gonna be able to get an electric car if they wanted to get one. It's just gonna be a transition point. So you're gonna to have to, uh, maybe this is where public transit comes in too, Mr. Mayor. I mean, uh, you know, and that can also be run uh, through, uh, you know, solar power. Okay, so um, uh, anybody have anything else to say about the electrification issue and funding? I don't know, what would you have done on uh, joint finance if uh, this comes to you, Mayor Crawford? <laughs> Well, I, I think it's uh, probably got some work to do. And as we've seen the last few years uh, in Madison, uh, agreement on transportation issues just isn't in the cards. And so it's probably very similar to uh, that in Washington, but uh, it would not be uh, probably, you know, things are changing though. I mean, things are changing, the world is changing and this is probably the direction we're headed in. So at some point, someone's gonna to have to deal with this. Okay, now when I wanna to turn to this broadband. It's, it's the one thing that I think everybody seems to agree is we should have more broadband. Uh, you know, uh, Governor Evers proposed uh, X amount then Republicans in the legislature wanted to, you know, double or triple it. And then there's a huge broadband component of this federal infrastructure bill. And Mr. Mayor of uh, uh, Mayor Barry, you talked about it's not just a rural problem. I guess though the the question is, uh, is this going to be like um, you know electricity uh, in the 30s? Are we going to do take it to the last mile? Uh, is that is that what we should be after here? That everybody should have access to broadband right where they live, Mr. Uh, Mayor Barry. I think they should. I think they should. And, and again, I want to speak at it from an urban perspective, because over the last 14 months, a, a real, real challenge that I saw right after the schools went virtual. So this was in March, April of last year was the central city where, by definition, everybody has access to broadband, but they don't have access to the same broadband. And so you've got a lesser product in the poorest parts of the city. And so you're going to have a situation where you might have three, four, five, six people in a house. And if two or three of those people school um, and you've got unstable or non-working equipment, all these educational gaps that we're talking about, these racial educational gaps get worse. And so there is an issue there. There's an issue with the providers. Uh, in, Com in Chicago, my understanding is Comcast is, because of the law, allowed much more flexibility. We don't have that same situation here in Wisconsin. We don't have that same situation. And that, that is increasingly becoming an issue of how do we get it to these lower income neighborhoods where, again, by definition, there is access, but what product is it and is it affordable? Right, you're saying there has to be, if you're going to deliver it, it has to be a higher standard. Yeah, right. if you've got a kid in third grade and they can't get on the computer, 
and they're going to fall farther behind. And that's, I think that's a, a moral duty for us to make sure that we're not putting those poorest kids in the worst situation pop possible when it comes to education. Okay. Uh, Mayor Crawford, what, what about delivering broadband, you know, to, you know, to where people live at, at a higher standard, like the uh, Mayor Barry was talking about? Yeah. The good news is, you know, at least in the Fox Valley, we most, almost, almost everyone has access to some sort of uh, broadband. We ourselves are, are bringing in another provider who's coming into our community as we speak to bring a better system, faster system, more reliable system. And uh, uh, that those are good things because the future is going to, you know, these kids, these businesses, our healthcare system, uh, big, bigger, better, faster, uh, technology is where it's going. And whenever you have these things, everyone wants the new iPhone. They want the upgrade. They want the best. They want, you know, and, and a lot of people can't afford it. A lot of people can't pay for it. Uh, but it's our, our, it is our opportunity and probably our obligation to make sure that, you know, even the, the poor people that, that can't afford it, the, the people who are out in the country, um, this has got to, you know, we, we, we all got to probably tackle this issue of better broadband, uh, more reliability in that uh, statewide. Uh, we have it. We'd like to do more smart city stuff with lights, uh, street lights and uh, smart city stuff is kind of uh, high tech Star Wars stuff. There's a lot of things that could save uh, community money uh, if you're allowed to spend those dollars on smart cities uh, stuff. OK, well, there's still some rural parts of uh, Waukesha County. Right. <laughs> there are, and there are some that don't have broadband right now. Uh, and so I think we're all in agreement that broadband is very important as we look to the future. And, and yes, I think it's as important as the phone system was. When you think about, as Mayor Copper was saying, most everybody has a, a cellular phone now, and a lot of the people are not even having landlines anymore. Uh, the challenge, you know, as we look at it continually is economic growth. Businesses need it. Our schools, like the mayor was saying, are really dependent on it now in how we're providing the education. In person is great, but there are times where we've got to have that flexibility to move out. The challenge in, and I know we're trying to talk about perfect worlds, Jeff, but again, the recovery, the rescue funds fund broadband transfer or broadband funding. They've got money allocated for it right now. The challenge we have right now is if you want to utilize that funds for broadband. It has to be a brand new project. It can't be one on the books. And so as most of us know, we work through a couple of years per project from design to implementation to completion to have only two years to come up with a plan, come up with a location, come up with a project and then spend the money is a, a challenge for all of us. And again, it's the outside that the federal government doesn't understand how the implementation works. It would be wonderful if they said, you guys have the money, here's what you can do, go use it the way best way you can, but they put those strings on. And so as we're looking at it, we really have to figure out how can we get the federal government to realize how businesses interact with local municipalities when it comes to dealing with a brand new type of utility like we have with broadband. Okay, well, we're uh, out of time here and uh, I wanna, Thank everybody for their involvement. Uh, Mayor Barrett has, uh, I think, he's back. Okay. I'm back. I'm Mayor back. Mayor Barrett for participating. Thank you, Waukesha County Executive Paul Farrow. Thank you, Nina Mayor Coffer. And thank you, Wisconsin DOT Secretary Thompson. And, of course, U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin. Uh, you know, this is such a big issue. I mean, it's going to take, uh, uh, you know, we're going to have to take small bites of this and uh, keep uh, assessing where this is going the state budget uh, will probably come out of the legislature around July 1, and we'll have another hint of uh, the state effort and, you know, and the pace of the federal infrastructure bill, uh, you know, will go into the summer too. So we'll, we'll keep you apprised. So um, uh, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for viewing. Uh, remember, we have an event tomorrow, wisbusiness.com on the summer tourism outlook. And, um, and uh, I want to thank our sponsors, of course. Uh, this event has been presented by Kapoor and uh, with additional sponsorship dollars from WTBA, the Wisconsin Transportation Builders Association and Construction Business Group, Building Wisconsin Together. So this is Jeff Mayer signing off for today and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks a lot. <laughs>